Hello, my name is Warren Ward and I'm going to read from my debut book, Lovers of Philosophy. If you've ever wanted to learn more about philosophy but have found the traditional texts a bit daunting, this might be the book for you. Here's Lovers of Philosophy, which was released in January 2022. I was inspired to write this book, which explores the love lives of seven philosophers and how their love lives shape their ideas. Um, by my reading of the novels of Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir many years ago. In those novels, and in particular in Simone de Beauvoir's novel, She Came to Stay, she describes Sartre not just as a philosopher, but as uh, her lover, as a very flawed human being. And she describes in their open relationship how um, when a young woman came into their home, she struggled with feelings of jealousy and insecurity. Reading about that really piqued my interest in wanting to learn maybe about the other personal lives and the lovers and the love lives of other philosophers. And I had this idea that if we could hear about that, it might make their philosophies a little bit more easy to understand. I'm going to read from chapter four, uh, which is about Heidegger. I should mention the seven philosophers featured in, in this book, are Immanuel Kant, Gail Hegel, Friedrich Nietzsche, Martin Heidegger, Jean Paul Sartre, uh, Michel Foucault, and Jacques Derrida. And from people who've read the book, they've told me it's an easy read, which, which I'm pleased to hear. So I've written it using the techniques of a novel, even though it's all factual, to bring the reader into the lives of these philosophers and understand them in terms of their relationships and also their historical context in which they were in. So I'm going to read from chapter four about Martin Heidegger. He was a really important philosopher in Germany in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, and as you'll hear from the reading, when he was married with two young children, uh, his life changed when a young student called Hannah Arendt walked into his lecture theatre. She would go on to become a, a very renowned philosopher in America too. She was Jewish and later Martin Heidegger joined the Nazi party and that caused quite a bit of tension and interesting dynamics in their relationship as it played out, played out over many decades. Anyway, here's the reading. This section is called When Heidegger Met Hannah. Martin Heidegger was mid-sentence when his stream of thought was interrupted by the slight of a slim, dark-haired student arriving late into his lecture theatre in early November 1924. As she climbed the stairs to search for a seat, he found himself staring at her for a few moments before realising all the eyes of the class were upon him. He regathered his composure and after pretending to be slightly irritated at the intruder's lateness, resumed speaking. He couldn't help noticing, however, as he glanced back in her direction, the incredible dignity and self-assuredness of this young student. He immediately sensed she was not like the others in his class. As she laid her books on her desk and looked up at him in silent anticipation, the other students looked to her and then to him, expecting and possibly even hoping Heidegger would deliver the latecomer a rebuke. But none came. The truth was that Heidegger was taken aback by the singular presence and beauty of this young fraulein in the grey cashmere pullover. Her dark wavy hair and slight build stood out like an island, against the sea of stocky Brunhildes that populated the rest of his class. The students at Marburg University, tucked away in this rural and conservative Catholic corner of southern Germany, were not used to seeing dark-haired people of Jewish descent, or any other ethnicity for that matter. Heidegger resumed his lecture. And so Aristotle, with his notion of being, set up a way of thinking that has dominated how we see the world to this day. True, it has given us logic and the more recent wonders of science, but Aristotle's attempts to objectively catalogue all of existence, animal, mineral and vegetable alike, has had the unfortunate consequence of us also incorrectly perceiving humans, ourselves, as objects. Whereas the truth is that human existence is irreconcilably different to that of rocks or trees. It is different in several crucial ways. The 18-year-old Hannah Arendt, had come a long way to hear Heidegger speak from the Baltic city of Königsberg, where another esteemed philosopher, Immanuel Kant, 
had delivered his famous lectures 150 years earlier. Arendt would later acknowledge how critical this 500-mile journey from Königsberg to Marburg had been for her early philosophical development. She had come solely to hear Heidegger, who had not yet published anything of note, but was quickly becoming renowned throughout Germany for his lectures. As Arendt would recall decades later, there was something strange about this early fame, stranger perhaps than the fame of Kafka in the early 20s, or of Brach and Picasso in the preceding decade, who were also unknown to what is commonly understood as the public and nevertheless exerted an extraordinary influence. For in Heidegger's case, there was nothing tangible on which his fame could have been based, nothing written save his notes, save for notes taken at his lectures, which circulated amongst students everywhere. These lectures dealt with texts that were generally familiar, they contained no doctrine that could have been learned, reproduced or handed on. There was hardly more than a name, but the name travelled all over Germany like the rumour of a hidden king. Arendt, like many Jews in Germany in the early 1920s, before anyone had foreseen the cataclysm yet to come, was desperate to assimilate, to become German, to join in that great heritage of cultured thought associated with Teutonic identity. The precocious young student was familiar with Kant, Hegel, and the more recent work of Friedrich Nietzsche. She adored the German composers Bach, Beethoven, and Mozart. Now she found it hard to believe she was actually here enrolled in the lectures of this great emerging mind, this hidden king, Martin Heidegger. Conversely, Heidegger was struck by something about this northern outsider who, on entering his classroom, had derailed his train of thought for the rest of that day. As he sat in his office that evening, he found it hard to focus. Unsettling images of this new arrival intruded on his consciousness. A dark, perfectly formed brow, her intelligent aquiline nose, her thin, turned-down lips. He was struck most, though, by her quiet, confident presence. It was as if she shone with a different energy to that of other students. The way the other students looked at her, it seems they noticed too. Heidegger determined that day that he had a duty to make this new student welcome. He decided he would invite her to his office for a meeting. Perhaps he could offer her some private lessons to help her catch up with the syllabus. She had, after all, missed the important first half of his lecture. It was the least he could do. So that's the end of the reading. Um, if you are interested in learning more about continental philosophy and each of the chapters, which each work uh, deal with a different of the seven philosophers, builds on the one before. So the whole book tells a story about the evolution of ideas in continental philosophy. But don't be put off by that. It's um, been read by many people who've never read philosophy before and they found the stories of each of these philosophers um, easy to read. Hope you uh, enjoyed if you do get to read Lovers of Philosophy. Thanks for your time.